Many years ago, in the continent of Doldia, there was once an unrivaled mage named Rydok. Not only did he possess the power that surpassed the king, but he also had the destructive seven treasures known as the Living Legends. His ruling would not last, however. Following his demise, the people sealed away the seven treasures. Little did they know that after a millennium, someone would free the entities they feared. Dubbed the Golem Master, Taka transcended Rydok's power in the domain of Earth magic. Switching to a brief flashback, Taka was a company slave in Japan, and his haggard face says clearly, on the fateful day, a strange man, who turned out to be a god, appeared before his eyes. Taka addressed him as a CEO for looking like an executive type. After the chit-chat, God mentioned Taka's struggles as an employee who has been treated as livestock by his company. With that, his passing did not come as a surprise. It appears that Taka died at the age of 42 because of overwork. When asked about his last memory before he succumbed to his death, Taka admitted that although he was ready to leave the world, he wished to be isekai Hearing this, God invited him to another world to redo his life. As a response, Taka demanded he get a job that would allow him to go home on time. As he specified all his preferred work conditions, God revealed that the world where he would be reincarnated has neither work conditions nor office hours. Instead, it would be a world of swords and magic. Shortly, he bestowed Taka with an increased affinity for the earth element. For his own amusement, God started the send-off ritual, with Taka protesting in the background. The latter requested to at least get some training, but to no avail. Annoyed by his nonchalance, Taka accused God of being like the other executives who used him for their own benefit, and before he knew it, he vanished into thin air. Despite Taka's suspicions, God sincerely hoped he would find the white company life in a fantasy world. Back to the present, the former corporate slave finds himself in an unfamiliar place. To his surprise, he lost his huge belly, and his voice became younger. While Taka tries to settle his nerves, he remembers the CEO words about granting him a stronger affinity for earth magic. Hence, he attempts to summon a golem. A few moments later, a strange sensation takes over his body. Thinking it's because of magic, he imagines himself as a character in the light novels he used to read. To his dismay, nothing happened, or so he thought. The ground starts shaking until something emerges from it. Lo and behold, a giant golem. Shocked, Taka slowly steps back until he falls into a massive hole. Scratching his head, he notices that he fell on something, revealing a large coffin beside him. Out of curiosity, he tries to open it, but he fails. He then asks the golem for help, and effortlessly lifts the lid. He chanced upon an underground stairway, which he believes is a dungeon entrance. He tries to ignore it until he hears someone's voice coming from the passage. Whoever is down under claims that he can't stand getting stuck there without any work. Safe to say that it's enough for Taka to change his mind as he rushes to check the area. Going down further into the stairs, he leaves the golem behind. Minutes later, he summons another golem, particularly a smaller one, to keep him company. He instructs the golem knight to lead the way, all the while thinking if he should retreat or not. Feeling a prick of conscience, he gets going until something cuts his cheek. Things escalate quickly when Taka gets surrounded by goblins, looking at him as if he is their next meal. Panic-stricken, he commands the golem to protect him. His ally manages to take down several goblins, but they just keep on coming. At that point, he begins to accept his second death, until he realizes that he is no longer powerless. Crouching on the ground, Taka conjures up bronze lances, with the guidance of the owner of the mysterious voice. After the desperate attempt to eliminate the monsters, a deafening silence fills the air. Once he opens his eyes, he is greeted by the goblins' lifeless bodies, feeling all sorts of emotions. Tears start welling up in his eyes, and he bursts out laughing. The voice then asks Taka why he struggled to eliminate the goblins when he possesses such power to control a high-caliber golem. In his defense, he stresses that he is still a beginner and did not receive any training. Soon afterward, Taka comes across an altar, over which he gets instructed to come up to it. Following the voice's orders, he recites a release spell, prompting a blinding light to come out. In no time, the chains wrapped around a strange box break. Rather than open the box himself, Taka commands the golem to do it. Turns out that a staff is inside the box, and it has been in confinement for a thousand years. After expressing gratitude, the voice introduces itself as the overlord of the seven artifacts, Diana. Baffled, he wonders where Diana actually is until he discovers that the one speaking is the staff itself. In an instant, the staff recorded Taka's aura pattern. For what it's worth, Taka blames God for not giving him a cooling off period before throwing him into an alternate world. Still processing his thoughts and emotions, he talks with Diana, who promises to never lead his side. With their conversation, it is revealed that in comparison with other elemental spells, summoning a golem requires a higher mana cost. 
The fact that Taka managed to carry it out as a newbie leaves Diana quite impressed. And so, they decide to check his status. Aside from learning that he turned 18 years old, Taka figures he has been blessed with a considerable number of skills. Looking at his stats, the staff reckons he is way stronger than Rydok, its Lord Creator. Diana notes that Taka might become more famous than the mentioned personage. When he asks about its confinement for 1,000 years, Diana stresses that Rydok was not the one responsible for such. According to Diana, its Lord Creator was a great and deeply compassionate man. However, after his death, his son attempted to keep the seven treasures to himself. Upon hearing how the son acted like an unscrupulous scoundrel, Taka is reminded of the second generation heirs in his previous world. As he puts it, the privileged few would just appear out of nowhere and easily snatch the director's position. Moreover, they would always accept multiple customer requests at the expense of their subordinates' work-life balance. After losing his composure with the workplace issues he experienced, Taka asks if the good-for-nothing son is the current CEO. Diana says no, revealing he was killed and that his magic power couldn't withstand the seven treasures. Time passed, the researchers from another country seized the artifacts, but then they couldn't decipher their properties. If anything, they were well aware of the treasure's immense power. Viewed as a menace to humanity, they separated the treasures and sealed them away. Taka then wonders if he deserves to be Diana's master, to which it says that he is worthy. From his ridiculous magic power to his pleasant personality, Diana continues to feed his ego. Flashing a self-satisfied smirk, Taka changes his tune about the CEO. After confirming that he received some OP skills, he believes he will thrive well in his new world. Speaking of which, in his current world, Earth magic is considered the strongest among the four elements. Through the use of alchemy, Taka can produce gold, silver, copper, and even mithril. He also learns about recovery magic, but only the acolytes of Belfast, the goddess of medicine and healing, hold such power. Taka states it would be troublesome if he suffered a severe injury. Diana urges him to undergo some training and get familiarized with his magic. Coincidentally enough, he stumbles upon a group of brigands who have been waiting for their next victim. When Anaki, the gang's leader, catches sight of Taka, he embodies the money mouth face emoji. It appears that elves are being sold to slave merchants for a hefty sum of money. In haste, Anaki orders his men to catch him. While Taka goes frantic, Diana feels otherwise, thinking it's his perfect chance to do some practice. For starters, he is instructed to summon and control a hundred golems. At that instant, Taka begins his unconventional on-the-job training. The brigands proceed to tackle him, only to get terrified at the sight of multiple golem knights. As they start to retreat, Anaki calls them out for their cowardice. Taka pulls another trick up his sleeve and equips his pawns with Sasumata weapons. Laughing maniacally, he feasts his eyes on the bad guys being captured, one after another. Amidst the fray, some of them try to escape, only to fail miserably. Sharing the golem's field of vision, Taka easily finds them. While he believes it's finally over, Anaki turns up with a little girl, threatening to hurt her. In exchange for not harming the poor kid, he demands Taka to let them go. He won't yield, however. He summons arms from the rock formation and restrains Anaki. For being rowdy, Diana suggests taking him down, but Taka refuses. He points out that he won't do anything reckless until he learns about the laws of his new world. That said, Diana reveals that it's normal to dispatch the brigands whenever they are discovered. Taka shrugs it off for the time being and checks on the little girl. As per Diana, the child is a wolf folk and is currently in bad shape after losing so much mana. Concerning this, she needs flesh or blood to recover. Without any sign of hesitation, Taka takes out a dagger and gives his arm a minor cut. After drinking his blood, the kid regains consciousness. Staring at the man in front of her, she embraces Taka and addresses him as her master. Feeling awkward, he pushes her back, but she will not budge. Truth be told, Taka finds her cute. She then introduces herself as Stella of the Wolfman Mafayu tribe. Apparently, she ended up in the bad guy's hands after being lured with a tasty-looking fruit. After what she went through, Taka decides to take her home, but she declines. Now that she has become a grown-up, Stella declares to stay by his side, with her master, forever. While Taka looks utterly confused, Diana reveals that his blood turns Stella into an adult in a matter of minutes. Indeed, he couldn't believe that his kind gesture would lead him into becoming a young girl's master. Some time later, they travel to the nearest town called Rijon. Accompanied by an army of golems, Taka wonders if the authorities will let them in. Witnessing quite a spectacle, Gothar, the commander of the Rijon Guard, shows up and commands Taka to state his identity and affiliation. Firstly, he introduces himself as a traveling mage. Secondly, he announces that he captured some brigands and he plans to turn them in. Upon recognizing the notorious group, 
the Summer Hayes, particularly their leader whose real name is Gaez, Guthur apologizes for his rude behavior. The commander claims he has been trying to hunt him down. Without further ado, he orders the arrest of the criminals who would likely face execution as punishment. Gaius pleads for his life, and even asks Taka to intervene, suggesting he make him his slave. Gothar then convinces him to let them deal with the matter in line with the country's laws. Feeling a bit uneasy, he speaks about the numerous armed knights surrounding them. Taka apologizes, and with a single flick of a finger, they crumble into pieces. All this time, Gothar thought they were actual knights and not golems. Just as they disappear, Gaius takes it as an excellent opportunity to fight back. He easily breaks out of the restraints with his knife and attacks Taka. Stella rushes to protect her master, leaving her with a stab wound. Taka watches in horror as she falls to the ground. Enraged, he lets out a blood-curdling scream as the sinister lights envelop his body. In a short while, Gaius meets his maker, shocking Gothar and his men. Taka immediately checks on Stella, who is still unconscious. Biting his arm, he takes some of his blood and transfers it into her through a gentle kiss. With Gothar figuring out if Stella is a wolf folk, Taka says she is his precious comrade. Much to his relief, she quickly recovers from the injury. While they take Gaia's corpse to the morgue and the other criminals to their prison, Gothar asks for Taka's identification apart from being an elf. Funnily enough, he just realized he has been reincarnated as an elf. The commander points out Taka's awkward antics, making him question if he is really an elf. Gothar shares that elves are lofty creatures in nature, and Taka seems the opposite. Following the law, the commander reiterates that he must first establish his identity. To start, he asks Taka to join a guild to earn his identity badge. Once he has been issued identification, Guthur instructs him to visit the town guard office to receive the reward for getting rid of Gaia's. Later that day, Diana takes Taka to the Explorer's Guild, where Rydok's friend used to be the guild master. Stella finds the place first and excitedly tells her master. Just then, he is greeted by a beautiful woman. He immediately informs her that he would like to register as a guild member. Once he steps inside, the receptionist grabs his attention. With the way she talks and acts, he is reminded of the Queen Bee in his previous work. Walking on eggshells, Taka starts signing up for his membership. The intimidating receptionist asks him to refer to the booklet detailing the guild's rules and procedures. She reminds him to abide by the rules so as to not get himself in trouble and earn the guild's support. Despite suffering flashbacks from being sanctioned by his superiors, Taka finishes his registration, all the while bawling his eyes out. Stella also signs up to be a guild member. After acquiring his explorer identification, he searches for an inn next. Recommended by the guild, they arrive at the Blue Phosphorescent Inn, and they receive a warm welcome. After securing a room, they decide to eat as Stella's stomach keeps growling. Scanning the booklet, Taka confirms that the guild doesn't offer any employee benefits. He then focuses on the maze explorations that take place in different settings. In most cases, monsters below the legendary class dominate the mazes. As he continues to digest all the information, Stella asks his permission before she eats. While she stuffs herself up with good food, Taka hears a commotion. Turns out that a man is harassing the barkeeper because she refuses to keep him company and prioritizes the other customers. The lady tells the troublemaker to adhere to the inn's rules while he is inside. While he continues to bother her, Taka interferes. With a sword pointed at his neck, he reminds his fellow explorer to act in accordance with the guild's rules. Acting all high and mighty, the man introduces himself as Last Nell the Windstorm. He notes that he is the only bronze-class explorer in town. As he blabs on and on about his contributions to the area, Taka mentions that he eliminated Gaius. Skeptical about his claim, Last now mocks him for making up stories. What better way to convince him than by summoning more golems? To save face, Last now says he is getting bored. Before he leaves, he announces that he will never step foot inside the inn again. Taka apologizes to the barkeeper for losing a customer, to which she replies that he actually did them a favor. Later that night, they hold a little party after bidding someone good riddance. Walking in the streets, Last Nell keeps smashing anything in his way, still pissed at what happened. While he still doubts that Taka killed Gaius, a man in a cloak turns up and proves the MC claim. With Gaius out of the picture, he asks Last Nell to be his next successor and continue the brigand's operations. Following the arrest of Gaius' men, he doesn't know exactly how he would take over his role. The small guy assures him he already has a plan. Meanwhile, Taka enjoys a hot bath. Joining him is Stella, who can't stop clinging to her master. Seeing her ears sticking out, he believes she's having a good time so far. When he speaks about returning Stella to her hometown, she instantly changes her mood. 
She confesses that she doesn't want to go back because her father will kick her out again. As it seems, after her mother passed away, his father completely changed. For looking like her mother, Stella would always get beaten and thrown out of the house. Taka tries to comfort her and gently rubs her ears, causing them to twitch. As he keeps touching her sensitive part, her low whimpers turn loud. He stops before things get out of hand. Hearing Taka and Stella seemingly having fun by themselves, Diana goes sulking. The following day, murmurs fill the streets. Taka approaches two guys and discovers that the brigands who were taken as prisoners have escaped. Not only that, they also robbed several merchant shops, which ended in a bloodbath. On a high alert, Gothar commands his men to guard certain areas. While he's at it, Taka arrives and confirms the circulating report to the commander himself. Gothar reveals that someone inside the Rijan helped free the criminals. Hence, he says sorry for his incompetence. Feeling uncomfortable, Taka doesn't know whether or not he should apologize. Suddenly, Batmunt, the Lord Viscount, shows up at the scene, catching the commander off guard. After claiming he's doing the rounds, Badmunt asks if Taka was the person responsible for capturing the brigands. When asked why he let the criminals live, Taka says he thought they would be under interrogation. He scoffs at his statement and blames him for putting the townspeople in a state of panic. Forcing Taka to take accountability, Badmunt orders him to hunt down the escapees. As for the reward, the Viscount offers 1.5 times the rate of the reward he received first. Well, it's not like Taka is not used to dealing with bosses beating down the price of labor every time they see an opportunity. Ultimately, he accepts the offer and searches for the brigands pronto. Just as he leaves, Badmon asks Gothar if Stella is a wolf girl. With Diana's help, Taka easily locates the bad guy's hideout inside a maze. He praises Diana for its exceptional ability, causing it to be flustered as it never hears such from Rydok. Diana then detects Lasnell's presence inside, leaving them thinking he has colluded with the brigands. He summons his knights and some gargoyle-type golems to aid them in case the enemies attack from above. Soon enough, they run into orcs, signaling the knights to tear them into pieces. Against Taka's wishes, Stella joins the battle. His jaws drop open when the innocent-looking girl annihilates the monsters four times her size. Diana explains that a grown-up wolf folk possesses the strength equal to ten knights. With her impressive latent power, there's a high probability that she came from a clan or royal lineage. If Diana's assumptions are true, Taka can't comprehend why the father neglected his daughter in the first place. Looking cute and terrifying at the same time, Stella flashes a smile whilst covered in blood. Just then, she leaps toward Taka, pinning him on the ground as some type of gas spreads out in the area. Diana says it's poison gas, prompting them to cover their mouths. Luckily, with the staff's help, Taka manages to create an antidote through alchemy. Elsewhere, Lassenel starts to get bored. As he hopes to stumble upon a woman as their pursuer, they hear footsteps approaching. This gets him excited, only to be told it might be Taka or an extermination squad. Lassenel orders his minions to plan an ambush attack by luring their pursuers further into the maze. Unfortunately for the brigands, with Diana's ability, Taka heard their plan loud and clear. On that note, he commands his golems to arrest those who surrender and kill those who resist. Soon enough, the brigands, who never learned from their first encounter with Taka and his knights, charge at them. In mere seconds, they travel to the afterlife. All the rest of them wave their white flags. Lastnell refuses to surrender. He launches an attack and lands a solid hit on his target. Having said that, he is clearly outnumbered. Desperate to make it out alive, he decides to enter the huge door. Diana informs Taka that there's a lurking high-rank monster beyond the door, and Lassnell might be planning to use it to defeat them. When Diana suggests they just close the door and call for reinforcements, Taka rejects it. Unwilling to get indebted to the arrogant Viscount, he resolves to finish Lassnell off once and for all. As soon as his eyes adjusted to the dark, he froze at the sight of the boss monster, a chimera. Scared to death, Taka tries to calm himself down. He calls upon the knights, but they are no match against the chimera. As the beast charges at him, Diana interferes and conjures up water spears. The staff alerts Taka about his opponent being a highly intelligent monster. From the looks of it, it can somehow read his moves, thus giving him a hard time. The gargoyle-type golems take over the battle, only to be devoured by the chimera. Out of options, he summons a new golem, the griffin. Taking advantage of its ability to fly, the griffin brings the battle into midair. Even though the golem holds out against the chimera's aggressive charges, the latter has its eyes on its number one prey. When the beast jumps up to Taka, Diana creates a water screen to buy him some time. As the chimera inches closer to him, he produces several iron lances that pierce its body. Shortly, the griffin returns to strike back. While the damage inflicted starts taking its toll on the chimera, 
Diana deals the decisive blow. Barely gathering his wits, Taka stares at the beast's remains, reduced to smithereens. Upon seeing an opening, Lastnell finally turns up to finish him off. Wearing a smug look on his face, he declares a premature victory. Much to his dismay, Stella steps in and blocks his sword. She quickly disarms Lastnell, not letting him get any nearer to her master. Before he knows it, he is standing below the spears. Unwilling to let him off the hook this time, Taka resolves to dispose of him. After settling the fight in their favor, the trio rejoices. Taka then notices his body is glowing, so he immediately checks his stats. Adding alchemy to his skill set, he just gained another cheat skill. Diana notes that alchemy requires gathering ingredients and sucking up too much mana. In Taka's case, ingredients are unnecessary, and he only consumes a small amount of mana. Back at the town, Gothar feels relieved to see them safe. With Badmunt giving Taka a side eye, he presents the escapees he captured. The commander recognizes Doldia, the man in a cloak, and expresses his disappointment towards him. Turns out that Gothar was taking care of the guy, but he chose to betray him and the entire Rijan in general. Doldi admits being grateful for all his help, but then he is not satisfied with the pay, leading him to join the brigands. As they get into a heated argument, the Viscount cuts in. Strangely enough, he asks Doldia if Lastnell is really the one behind the escape of the criminals. Doldia seems confused by Batman's questioning until he realizes he is after the wolf girl. Soon afterward, he announces that Taka is the mastermind of the brigands' breakout. There and then, the Viscount accuses him of plotting everything so he could get his hands on the reward. Claiming to be a passionate man, Badmon asks Taka to hand over Stella in exchange for sparing his life. Without having second thoughts whatsoever, he refuses. Tired of carrying out the absurd demands of the people who hold so much power in the hierarchy, Taka has no plan to yield. Having been granted another shot at life, he swears to live as he pleases. With that, he summons the knights. Alarmed, Badmunt warns Taka that he will not go unpunished with what he's doing. The latter makes it clear that he hasn't even attacked him. With a menacing expression, he asks the Viscount about his accusations. Rather than answer his question, Badmunt activates the victim card by making it appear that he's threatening him. To make his act more convincing, Taka summons an ogre, stopping the Viscount's minions from tackling him. While they are paralyzed with fear, the ogre makes its move and smashes the ground. Guthar intervenes and volunteers to bear witness against Badmunt. Needless to say, the Viscount is not pleased with his decision. Despite the huge possibility that he will be subjected to harsh punishment right after, Gothar begs Taka for mercy. While he appreciates the commander's resolve, all he wants is for Badmunt to speak the truth. Sweating bullets, the Viscount takes his words back, and just like that his expression brightens up, and the ogre disappears. Gothar then gives him some of the rewards for his service. When Taka is asked where his next destination is, he shares that he might search for Stella's hometown. Concerning this, the commander warns him about the wolf folks being in high demand. For being a rare race and holding the power of long Evety in their blood, people hunt them down for money. He advises Taka to keep Stella's real identity a secret. After that, Gothar informs him to head to the east to find her hometown. Before they part ways, they express their gratitude to each other. Just as Taka turns his back, Gothar attempts to bid him goodbye for good. He won't succeed, however. In disbelief, the commander questions when did Taka realize his true motive. He states that he knew it from the start. As a previous company slave, he can relate to Gothar for doing anything his superior asked him to do. Taka warns him about the consequences he would face after failing to assassinate him. That said, the MC highlights there's no need to stand against someone who is completely superior in power, nor must he feel compelled to do something even if it's wrong. Gothar takes offense as someone who took an oath of fealty. Taka makes it clear that he is not insulting his pride as a knight. For a cunning guy like the Bad Mutt, Taka tells Gothar that when he dies, the Viscount will neither care for his family nor protect his honor. Given the present circumstances, Taka urges Gothar to get strong and resist, even if it means going up against his duty. After the pep talk, Taka plans to leave something that will remind Rijan of his visit. Meanwhile at the castle, Badmunt has already prepared an alibi after the failed attempt to eliminate Taka. He made it appear that Gothar acted without his permission. To protect his image as a kind Viscount, Gothar was only demoted. Unbeknownst to him, Taka is aware of all his schemes. Through the use of a golem bird, he confronts Badmun about his ploy, but he keeps playing innocent. When he tries to catch the bird, Taka alerts him that its beak is covered with poison. As a response, the Viscount warns him that he won't get away if he kills a high-ranking noble like him. Unfazed, Taka says it will be hard to prove that he is behind Badmun's passing. As the Viscount gets all worked up, Taka reveals he has positioned several goblins around him. 
with the unique CCTVs watching Batman, he urges him to do good to avoid an untimely death. Out of desperation, the Viscount offers money to Taka to leave him alone, but it's a futile effort. Elsewhere, Guthur is spotted seemingly happy as he finally comes to his senses. On the other hand, Diana speaks about Taka being soft-hearted after subjecting the Viscount to a mild punishment. He tells the staff to let it go since they got paid for all the trouble after all. Now that they are outside Rajan, the trio sets forth for another adventure. This time, they are going to the walled city of Makumba. Following Gother's revelation about the wolf folks, Stella mentions she still might be able to use her power in her human form. Taka advises Stella to refrain from transforming into her wolf form, so she won't stand out and attract bad guys. Having met many people with corrupt minds, Diana suggests they just annihilate whoever gets in their way. At that moment, Taka tells the staff to only use its magic if the situation calls for it. After the encounter at the Ridge on Maze, Taka knows that he needs to up his game. In addition, he wishes to learn pharmaceutics since he can't use healing magic. Diana then remembers a high potion recipe, but unfortunately, they don't have the ingredients. To get a hold of them, Taka suggests they visit the dungeon where he found the staff. Upon arriving at their destination, they discover that the place has turned into a maze. Suffering from intrusive memories, Diana asks Taka's permission to go all out should a fight erupt. Despite having reservations, he allows the staff to take charge. Walking further into the maze, Diana alerts them to step back as a bunch of goblins show up. With a single spell, Diana eliminates the small fry. Stella asks if she can be of help, to which Taka says they leave the matter to Diana. Minutes later, they come across a large door making them wonder if there's a boss monster inside. Diana tells them not to worry as Taka opens the door. Once inside, the sound of the rattling chains startles him. A giant scorpion appears, or more specifically, the monster that locked up the staff. Indeed, Diana is desperate for revenge after spending a millennium trapped inside the dungeon. The scorpion initiates the battle and strikes them with its tail made of chains. Diana creates an iron wall, causing the chains to break. It launches another attack, but Stella jumps into the scene to protect her master. Amidst the fight, Diana notices that compared to Rydok, Taka is inexperienced, but somehow, his cool-headedness makes up for what he's lacking. Determined to settle the score with the scorpion, Diana asks Taka to link up their mana. Once their mana connects, Diana prepares to deliver the decisive strike. With Starbreaker, the staff has made sure that the scorpion won't be able to imprison it anymore. Taka and Stella can't help but praise Diana's OP skills. Looking at the scorpion's remains, Taka couldn't believe the chains turned into a monster. Moving on, Diana informs him that they need to gemify the black particles. According to the staff, the process falls under earth magic, which changes a material's properties. After collecting the scorpion's remains, Diana magically turns them into sparkling gems. Later on, it finally arrive at the walled city of Makumba. Taka notes it's four times the size of the town of Rijan. As they stroll around the street, they run into some slaves inside a cage. Diana explains that with their number, there's a high chance that the city houses plenty of mazes. In connection, the explorers use the slaves as baits whenever they go on a quest. Diana adds that since they can't disobey their master, they are useful to people who hold many secrets. Upon asking Taka if he wants to buy one, he loses it. He stresses that he can't trust a person who's only being forced to obey a master. As someone who wanted to punch his previous boss before, it goes without saying that he knows better. After Diana apologizes, Taka shares that even if subordinates follow their superior's orders, there's no guarantee that acts of sabotage will not happen. Stella then wonders if Taka doubts her loyalty, to which he replies she is not his slave. Suddenly Mosser, a slave trader, cuts in and claims there are still trustworthy slaves. He invites Taka to check his wares, and by wares he means the slaves. He declines his invitation and reiterates he is not interested in acquiring such. After the brief encounter with the creepy guy, Taka hopes not to get involved with the likes of him. Just then, Mosser asks a woman if she wants to be sold to a gentle master like Taka. Going by the name Sherry, she claims that having a kind master won't get rid of the indignity she suffered. Mosser lets her be and tosses her a bag of coins. He notes that if Sherry fails to repay him within a week, she will definitely become a slave. She takes the money and walks away. Now inside a different guild, Stella is surprised to see the place filled with people. Taka approaches the receptionist and requests a maze exploration permit. After verifying his identification badge, the receptionist issues the permit which is valid for a month. While searching for the purchase encounter to sell the magic stones, someone interrupts them. Well, Taka saw it coming though. Staring down at him, the big guy tells Taka that sightseeing with a kid and maze exploration are two different things. 
Annoyed, he orders Taka to go back to wherever he came from. When he mentions he can fight despite his looks, the man suggests they test it. Fuming, he goes in for a right hook, only to get a boxer's fracture as his fist landed on the golem's hard rock body. Taka expresses his concern, but the man is clearly not having it. He tries to punch him with his left hand but Stella blocks it. While the haughty explorer drops to his knees in humiliation, the spectators can't believe an iron rank can summon a high-level golem. Among them is the silver-class explorer Mary, who praises Taka's undeniable skills. After getting his name, Mary requests to get a closer look at his staff. He declines as Diana tells him it can't imagine feeling someone else's touch. Claiming his tribe has strict rules, Taka keeps the staff to himself. A few steps away from Mary, Diana states that had he not stopped insisting, the entire guild would blow up with Starbreaker. Finally, at the purchasing center, the personnel asks where Taka obtained the gems. When he shares it's from a chimera, the personnel is dumbfounded. Once he recovers, he urgently takes the payment for the valuable items. Overhearing about Taka defeating the boss monster in the Rijan maze, some explorers express their doubts. Talking to himself, Mary, as a silver class, is unsure if he can take down the chimera by himself. Stealing glances at the staff, he wants to have it, one way or another. Later that day, they go to a place called Dalra Workshop. According to Diana, a bad-tempered dwarf manages the shop. Even so, since he's the best alchemist in the city, they refuse to go home early. If anything, Diana and Stella swear to protect Taka should a conflict arise. As soon as they step inside, they are greeted by Linda, a female dwarf whom Taka mistook as a child because of her size. He apologizes for his uncalled for behavior. After formally introducing himself, Taka proceeds with his request. He wants her to teach him alchemy. While she is left confused, Dalro, the shop's owner, enters the picture. With furrowed eyebrows, he questions why there is an elf inside his establishment. After mistaking Linda for the alchemy expert, Taka begs Dalro to take him as an apprentice. Initially, the male dwarf declines but when Taka brings up his title as the golem master, he immediately piques his interest. As if he flips a switch, Dalro requests he show him a golem. Grabbing his shoulders and shaking them, he asks Taka to hurry up. Linda steps in, stopping Dalro from pestering the guest. After receiving an earful for his reckless behavior, Dalro feels relieved to see Taka still alive. A few moments later, he finally grants his request. Dalro examines the golem and comments that its magic power is evenly distributed. However, he states that the material is a letdown. According to the expert, the simple steel will only get him through half of the Makumba's mazes. Taka then mentions he can maintain a golem for two days. After having more conversations about his earth magic, Dalro changes his tune about having Taka as his apprentice. All things considered, he needs the approval of the Council of Elders. Taka seems confident it won't be a problem as he takes out a valuable item. Known as the Hihiro gain from the scorpion's tail, Dalro gasps in amazement. Taka assures Dalro he will give him the Hihira game when he secures the spot as his apprentice. Dalro asks Taka to give him a week and takes it upon himself to get the elder's permission. He instructs Linda to prepare his things, but she already has his stuff ready. When Dalro calls Linda his wife, Taka is too stunned to speak. All the while, he thought Linda is his daughter. Before they leave the shop, Dalro hands him the mithril recipe as a deposit. Taka assures him he will practice and come prepared in their next meeting. Having said that, Diane asks how he will train himself to which he says by exploring the maze. All of a sudden, a small group of thugs surround them. The unimportant characters cut to the chase and declare to steal the staff. With Taka getting sick of the everyday scenarios, Stella saves him the trouble of beating the thugs. While Diana and Taka talk about Stella getting more and more vicious, Mary hurls a fireball at them. Fortunately, a woman steps in, deflecting the magic attack with her sword. Turns out that it's Sherry, who can still feel the presence of the culprit hiding behind a tree. In connection, Diana has put a mark on him, so they can run after him any time. Setting it aside for the time being, Taka thanks Sherry for saving them. After introducing herself as a silver-class explorer, she asks to join their party even just for a week. Regardless of Taka's current rank, Sherry highlights his feat of defeating a chimera, making him as powerful as the silver-class explorers. Knowing full well that she has more reason to join their party, Taka asks about it. Sherry admits owing the slave trader some money, which she used to pay for her mother's medical bills. She also speaks about the possibility of becoming a slave if she fails to return the money. She used to pay her debt regularly until she got injured, and thus forced her to borrow more from Mosser. Hearing this, Taka claims he's not the right guy to team up with. As someone who's about to become a slave, Sherry claims there are no other parties that are willing to take her. In exchange for receiving help from Taka, 
she promises to teach him everything she knows about the mazes. While Taka remains unsure, Sherry begs him to reconsider his decision. After that, he asks Stella and Diana if they don't mind adding another member to their group. The former stresses that if Taka is fine with the setup, then it's the same for her. On the other hand, Diana permits it, only because Sherry will accompany them in just a week. Aside from thanking him, she grabs his hand and lets him feel her natural cushions. Later that day, they start the maze exploration. Taka finds the place weird, but Sherry tells him it's the standard type. Not to mention that the maze has an elevator. As the experienced one in the group, Sherry suggests they start on the 20th floor. Before they enter the maze, Taka speaks about having a child with him, Stella. Basically, he only wants to work eight hours a day with one hour break. With the confused Cherry in the background, he continues by saying that the compensation will be divided equally. Should any one of them suffer an injury while on a mission, the medical payments will be deducted from the compensation first, after which the remaining money will be evenly split. Since Sherry will be in the front line and will probably benefit the most from his suggestion, she wonders if Tucker really means it. He stresses that it's a fair trade because she will share her knowledge about the maze. Surprise, Sherry thanks him for his kind disposition. After reaching an agreement, they finally enter the maze. Talking to herself, Sherry couldn't be any happier that she stumbled upon Taka. Once on the 20th floor, they chance on other explorers inside. It hasn't been a minute until some guys recognize Sherry and talk about her becoming a slave. Tapping her shoulder, Taka tells her to ignore them, with Stella trying to make her feel better too. After a while, Sherry decides to go down to the 30th floor. Taka summons the knights, leaving the other explorers gasping in awe. As Sherry gives them the direction, Diana senses the presence of monsters at their next stop. The staff notes they are about to face a horde of goblins, which doubles the number in Rijon. Sherry then asks Taka if he has a sensitive nose, or if he uses some exploration magic to detect the enemies. Just then, Stella claims to smell the monster's scent. She asks her master's permission to let her take care of the goblins, but Sherry volunteers to do it. When Taka puts the golems forward, Sherry stresses her role as the party's frontline fighter. With her skill, Sherry states she was about to become the star explorer of the lower floors in Macumba. To prove her claim, she activates Double Shadow, creating her own clone. In a snap of a finger, she takes down multiple goblins. First time seeing such a technique, Taka watches Sherry walk the talk. While she leaves him impressed, Diana finds her fairly good. For the record, the staff can wipe out all the enemies in one go. When Sherry asks how's her performance, Taka calls it splendid whilst looking at her chest. She then mutters that she used to think elves prefer smaller ones. As a man of culture, Taka declares all watermelons, regardless of size, should be valued equally. Crouching on the ground, he gives himself some time to reflect after saying such. That is until Diana interrupts Taka and informs him of the new threat nearby. This time, the original team takes over, granting Sherry a little break. Taka and Stella rush to the scene with the former summoning golems to overrun the area. While they stomp on the goblins, Stella, with bloodlust in her eyes, crushes every monster on her way. As expected, the other explorers stare daggers at them. Diana wishes to join the fun, but Taka forbids it to use his power because there are a lot of onlookers. When Stella announces she has slaughtered all the monsters, Cherry can't believe it. At the same time, some guys question why Taka teamed up with her. More than the skills, they assume Sherry used her body to get through their party. Shifting to another flashback, Daryu, the scout of Sherry's former party, took an interest in her. Even though it wasn't clearly stated, he must have fallen in love with her. With Sherry's exceptional talent, May's explorations were relatively smooth sailing for their party. Because of her gravely ill mother, she worked so hard to the point that she sacrificed her soul for money. As Sherry started losing grip and her body reached its limit, the core member turned into a dead weight. For pushing herself too much, she found herself lying helpless in front of a goblin lord. Ultimately, Daryu protected her from the monster, which cost him his own life. Back to the present, Sherry clenches her fist as she remembers Daryu. Meanwhile, at the street market, Taka treats Stella to some fruits. While Diana claims he is spoiling her, someone calls the attention of the golem master. Introducing himself as Troy, the leader of the Rust Party, he asks Taka to join them. When the MC questions why they are inviting a low rank, Troy admits planning to use his golems to conquer the bottom floors. With that, Taka turns him down. One of the party members throws a fit, and as he keeps spewing nonsense, Taka calls upon his knights. Witnessing him summon the golems instantly, they are truly gobsmacked. Troy tries to convince him again, but he still rejects the invitation. As per Taka, he's not interested in exploring the bottom floors, and he already has a party. Troy questions why Taka is partnering with a slave, to which the latter says she is not yet one. 
Just then, Troy reveals they used to be in the same party with Sherry. He alerts Taka that being involved with her won't do him any good because she has killed a comrade before. Much to their shock, Taka doesn't really care about it. As he puts it, even if Sherry is in fact a killer, whatever her background story is has nothing to do with him. Just as Taka leaves, Troy's men ask if they will just let him go easily. As a response, Troy states they shouldn't be associated with a broken human being. Sometime later, Taka arrives at their meeting point an hour early, the same way he showed up at the office before. Getting back to business, Sherry advises everyone to keep their guard up because she hasn't gone down below the 32nd floor. On their way, she tries to calm herself down. Once the elevator door opens, Sherry grits her teeth as the goblin lord who killed Daryu appears before her eyes. In haste, she eliminates the goblin standing in her way. Taka and Stella both agree that she is scary. The former then recalls Cherry's words, making him realize she must have been stopped on the 32nd floor. There and then, Taka figures out they are in the same spot where her comrade died. While Sherry goes berserk, the other goblins start charging at the duo. Following a storm of rocks crashing the monsters, Sherry finally comes face to face with her prey. The goblin lord initiates the battle, prompting Diana to ask if they should lend her a hand. Taka stresses they shouldn't intervene and let Sherry resolve her own problem. Speaking of which, the Goblin Lord manages to startle Sherry as it cuts her hair. As she musters all the courage she can find, she goes all out on the offensive and defeats her opponent. At that instant, she has avenged Daryu. Taka approaches Sherry, staring blankly into space. She apologizes for being carried away by her emotions, to which he says it happens, and there's no need to say sorry. In tears, Sherry thanks him for being empathetic. Back at home, Sherry is seen cooking whilst humming a cheerful tune. It appears that tomorrow is the day they will set foot on the 40th floor. The area is known to be the entrance to the world of bottom floor explorers. It is also the place that Sherry and her previous party couldn't penetrate, and thus they failed to reach their goal. That said, with Taka's help, she is now a step closer to reaching her dream. Shortly, her mother walks in and notices her daughter is in a good mood. Sherry reminds her mother not to push herself and gives her the money she earned. Sherry shares she's lucky to have a kind partner, and it won't take long until she becomes a bottom floor explorer. Hearing this, her mother feels bad because her daughter keeps putting herself at risk for her sake. To make her feel any better, Sherry tells her not to worry about it. As soon as she steps outside, Mary greets her. Glaring at him, Sherry asks about his motive for showing up at her doorstep. Mary congratulates her for making it through the floor she has a deep-seated grudge for. He then brings up the fate awaiting her, becoming a slave. Mary says it would be such a waste if an explorer with consummate skills ends up as such. With that, he proposes to take Sherry's debt on himself. After recovering from being taken aback, Sherry asks if he has any idea about how much money she owes to Mosser. Turns out that Mary knows it's around 300 gold, and he can lend the full amount to her any time. Knowing full well he isn't concerned about her, Sherry asks what he is really after. And so, Mary says it's the staff which he believes is an artifact that grants Taka a boost in power. Having fought alongside Taka, Sherry can't deny he has some OP skills. Mary notes that when a legendary class artifact is bound in a master-servant contract, no one can touch it until its master dies. To put it simply, he wants Taka to vanish. Sherry eventually realizes Mary was behind the ambush attack back then. Because she messed up his plan, he asks Sherry to make it up to him. In exchange for the money, she needs to get rid of Taka. With the duo's images in mind, Sherry declines his proposal. Mary tries to get into her head and accuses her of killing a comrade. While he insists she has no right to act all virtuous, she begs him to stop. Mary makes it clear that Sherry doesn't necessarily have to stain her hands with Taka's blood. Instead, he wants her to abandon him. According to Mary, no explorer would survive the 40th floor without prior knowledge about what awaits them there. Before he leaves, he advises Sherry to think things through. Later that day, they continue their exploration, with Sherry seemingly preoccupied. Taka checks on her, to which she assures him she is fine. Since they are going to the 40th floor tomorrow, Taka calls it a day early. While Stella informs her master that she has leveled up, Sherry keeps mum about what's bugging her. Walking back home, she has decided not to let Mary trump her moral compass. That is until she is greeted by the same man, standing beside her mother at home. In tears, she informs her daughter that Mary will pay off her debts. Her mother can't contain her emotions, thinking Sherry will no longer be compelled to put herself in danger. Before Mary leaves, he reminds Sherry of their plan tomorrow. And just like that, she falls into despair. Caught up in Mary's trap, Sherry reminds Taka and Stella to be cautious, claiming she has no idea about the next monster they will face. 
After some time, Diana alerts its master a monster ahead. A human-like figure with four arms and an elephant's head comes into view. While Taka and Diana still figure out what kind of monster just popped up, Stella lunges at it. Sherry is about to warn them but she can't bring herself to do it. After turning the weird-looking monster into a punching bag, it suddenly trumpets. As the sound echoes across the space, loud roars respond to the monster. Diana informs Taka that all the monsters from the floor are heading their way. As they begin to panic, Taka commands the staff to enlighten him about what's happening. As per Diana, there exists a creature that can be mistaken as the boss monster. Despite it being a dummy, when it feels threatened, it will call upon all the monsters on the floor. In no time, they are surrounded by multiple monsters. Taka asks Sherry for help, but she can only say sorry as she leaves them behind. Unfazed, he summons his legion, which is a lot more than Sherry's double shadow. At that point, Diana declares they have been set up. Even so, Taka has no plan to let the people against him win. Hence, he orders the knights to destroy the monsters. Meanwhile, Mary, with his subordinate and accomplice Sherry, are seen waiting elsewhere. The rowdy guy claims a typical explorer wouldn't last 10 minutes inside the 40th floor, given the number of all the monsters there. Once the sound of rumbling subsides, they check the area and see blood scattered everywhere. While Mary acknowledges Taka's resolve to fight until he dies, Sherry has an attack of conscience. Sitting comfortably on the pile of the monster's corpses, Taka greets Mary. Seeing him alive, Mary is at a loss for words. Sherry drops to her knees and apologizes for abandoning them. She confesses it was because of her mother that she was forced to betray him. Cracking a smile, Taka tells Sherry that her apology is not needed. As he puts it when choosing between a family and a stranger, it's a no-brainer that one will prioritize his or her own blood. Mary's subordinate fires an arrow at Taka, only to be blocked by a golem. After witnessing his ally's death, Mary attacks Taka with fire magic. However, his spell fails to pierce the MC defense. At one's wit's end, Mary welcomes his imminent death. Screaming in agony, his own magic sends him to the afterlife. Shifting his attention to Sherry, Taka asks the reason behind her tears. Setting the record straight, he tells her not to feel bad about betraying him. After all, he only sees her as a pitiful stranger whom he can never trust. Talking to herself, Sherry is unsure if she's crying because Taka doesn't trust her or because of how terrible she is as a person. In the meantime, the golem knocks her out cold. Once outside the maze, Diane asks Taka about his decision to let Sherry go. He says what he did was enough as he is sure she won't threaten him again. Following what he said to Sherry a while back, Diane asks him if he will ever trust someone again. Taka admits it's hard for him to trust anyone, to which Stella tells him she won't ever betray him. He reminds her that nothing is constant and that when she grows up, she might fall in love with someone. With a long face, Stella states she won't fall for anyone except her master. She hopes to be more grown up and wishes Diana to be a human, so they can understand Taka better. Now that she mentioned it, the staff thinks it's a good idea to have a human form. Should Diana appear more human-like, it wonders if it will help earn Taka's trust, while he doesn't know exactly what to feel about it. Stella suggests they turn Diana into a human golem. Diana admits that even though it will feel great to have a body, the process won't be a walk in the park. Nonetheless, Stella believes Diana will turn out pretty. The staff notes its magic core is the heart of an old dragon, meaning to say the human-like vessel must withstand an enormous amount of magic power. Since they have yet to know where to start, they decide to visit Dollar Workshop. On their way, Taka imagines Diana as a beautiful girl with a chest flat as a board. The staff asserts that the image he has in mind is downright wrong. Hearing this somehow boosts Stella's confidence, leaving Diana sulking. Upon arriving at the shop, Dalro asks Taka to wait for a bit because he's still talking to someone. Once they are done, he asks the two dwarfs if they are siblings. Despite looking identical, they seem shocked when Taka finds out they are brothers. Soon afterward, Taka asks for an update about his apprenticeship. To his delight, the Council of Elders approved Dalro's request. Well, they didn't have a choice because he would have left the council if they didn't give their permission. Dalro's older brother introduces himself as Herbst and mentions that the former owes him a lot. Taka extends his hand as he states his name. After exchanging pleasantries, Herbst asks what he wants to learn from his brother. When Taka reveals he wants to make a human golem, the look on their faces says it all. From feeling emotions to life functions, he wants the golem to be as human as possible. Herbst tells him that what he's planning is no different from creating a new race. Even so, Taka definitely piques his interest. Herbst invites him for a drink to talk more about his plan. For a second, Dalro forgets Taka is his apprentice as his brother takes over his role. The next day, Taka complains of a headache after drinking too much last night. 
Contrary to how terrible he felt at company parties, he had fun with the Dwarf Brothers. No longer being treated as a laughingstock, Taka balls his eyes out. Back at the shop, he feels a twinge of envy when he notices Dalro seemingly unaffected by the hangover. To start the master and apprentice relationship, Dalro gives him a lecture. According to him, alchemy and blacksmithing are two different things. The former involves producing ingredients of a certain quality, while the latter is the art of forging materials from the ingredients. At first, he expected Dalro would only give him a manual and let him learn by himself. The fact that he was blessed with a hands-on master, he felt over the moon. Later on, Taka finds himself in a room loaded with weapons. Dalro then leads him to the weapons he forged. He instructs Taka to use Analyze and Alchemy and choose his best pick. Taka starts doing what he's told until he grabs a sword. While he looks satisfied with his chosen weapon, Dalro cuts his sword. He commends Taka's ability to analyze, however, determining a sword's components through the said process is not enough. Dalro comments he still has a lot to learn to utilize analyze effectively and understand alchemy. At that moment, Taka remembers his grandfather saying that a swordsmith would put all his heart into forging a sword. From a simple lump of steel, it could incredibly transform into a strong material and produce a powerful weapon. This gives him all the more reason to learn from his master. A week later, Herbst arrives at the shop. When he's asked what brings him there, he says he wants to borrow Taka. Despite having a bad feeling about it, Dalro grants his apprentice a day off. Some time later, Herbst drags Taka into his hideout, or more accurately, in his laboratory in the Kingdom of Granada. The moment they walk inside, they are greeted by a doll named Beatrice. Still shocked from seeing a humanoid character, more of them turn up. Taka then confirms if Herbst is a blacksmith or a doll maker. Turns out that he is both, but his real job is blacksmithing. Hertz shares that the three girls in front of him are part of his early automatic dolls. While they look lovely, he stresses that they are not solidly built, so he needs someone's assistance. A new character walks in, Lakshmi, Herbst's apprentice and fiancé. As it seems, from Herbst's perspective, they have broken off their engagement. However, because Lakshmi's father wouldn't approve of it, she still considers herself his fiancé. While the sight of the couple reminds Taka of Beauty and the Beast, Herbst directs his eyes to his finger because he keeps staring at her chest. As Taka allows his intrusive thoughts to win, he apologizes. Herbst then tells Lakshmi up front that he is not going to marry her for the sake of her own happiness. As he expresses his concern, Lakshmi suggests they get married soon. Seeing a girl falling head over heels with an old man, Taka can't help but curse the infamous Raiju. Soon enough, Herbst asks Lakshmi to leave them for a moment. She agrees, but in exchange, they will have supper together later. Taka is convinced that Lakshmi ticks all the boxes for business management. On a more serious note, Hertz shares he is serious about not marrying her. As he puts it, he is scared of losing Lakshmi. He fears that one day, she will just change and he will be alone. In his current state, he's aware that he can't love someone. Diana mutters that to an extent, Hertz and Taka are the same. He agrees, saying he has felt the same as the one who was left behind with nothing but painful memories. This is why he doesn't trust anyone because betrayal can only happen if a person trusts someone. Hertz mentions his desire to create something eternal to help him move forward. He offers his knowledge and support to Taka in return for his help in finding eternity. He accepts it and Hertz just can't thank him enough. After that, the old man asks Lakshmi to prepare some tea. While they are at it, Taka assures Diana he won't tell Herbst about their power as a duo. Interestingly enough, even after Herbst showed his vulnerability and talked with sincerity, Taka still doubts him. Without question, he admits he is beyond redemption. The following day, Dalru instructs Taka to turn down the flame. Panic-stricken, he closes the door of the chamber, but the flames still burn fiercely in the door's edges. Thankfully, it stops, but Dalru won't stop scolding him as he almost sets the entire building on fire. He reminds Taka that for a smith, kiln operation is not simply transforming materials at high temperatures. He also advises him to use his elemental magic to produce an alloy with different properties. When Dalro opens the chamber, he spots a shirigane, or a white metal, that surpasses the magic capacity of the mithril. In disbelief, he grabs Taka and demands an explanation about how he made it. After a while, Dalro learns that his apprentice can only use earth magic. By applying his magic in large amounts, Taka has created a shirigain. From giving him an earful for almost burning the house down, Dalro asks him to light the kiln again to solve the mystery of it all. As he orders Taka to do extra work, he snaps. He points out that he reincarnated in a fantasy world to experience a white company life where overtime work does not exist. Dalro replies that if he solves the mystery, he can work flex time. Since they couldn't come to an agreement, 
Dollar drags Taka to the chamber. A few days later, Harps drops by the shop. He asks Taka how's his apprenticeship going, to which he says it has become flex time. Harps then tells him he needs his help. While enjoying some coffee, he informs Taka about the Citri sighting on the 47th floor. According to Harps, the beast possesses a rare skin which makes it an expensive item. He adds that it's an ideal ingredient in making a doll's skin as it resembles a human's. Concerning its magic power capacity, Diana approves the combination of the Citri's skin and the alloy. Staring into each other's eyes, the two guys who resonate with each other seal the deal. For all that, Stella wonders why they are maintaining eye contact for so long. Later that day, they come across some people talking about the Citri. Apparently, the silver party called Polaris was trounced by the beast. Only the scout and the cleric managed to survive. When Taka arrives at the guild, the receptionist immediately calls for his attention. She informs Taka that the head of the guild has made a special request for him. For the NTH time, he uses being a beginner as an excuse, but the girl brings up his exploration on the 40th floor. And that's it, he runs out of excuses. Coincidentally enough, the guild's request is for the Citri to be exterminated. The staff explains that Citri is a high-class monster that only gold-class explorers can stand up against. More intelligent than a chimera, Diana warns Taka that his previous opponents don't hold a candle to the Citri. With Polaris as the top party in Macumba, it can be noted that there's no gold-class party in the city. While Taka and Diana talk about how strong the enemy is, Stella innocently asks if the Citri will be their next prey. Feeling pumped, Stella swears to give her master a show. Overhearing Stella's statement, the other explorers call Taka a monster for letting a child fight. On their way to the maze, Taka feels satisfied that he's about to hit two birds with one stone with the Citri extermination request. After hours of bickering with Diana about its human body which he pictured in mind, they finally arrive at the maze. There, they chance upon two people. The girl approaches Taka and introduces herself as Irona, clerk of the Polaris. She requests to accompany him on his quest and promises not to get in his way. As she swears not to be a hindrance, Taka can't help but laugh before declining her request. Masala, the party's scout, grabs him by the collar, informing him that he's disrespecting the highest class cleric in Makumba. Taka makes it clear that he has his reasons. Irona asks him to reconsider his decision as he needs more manpower to fight against the Citri. Taka states he doesn't need additional members because his small party is enough. He then suggests Irona to tag along with other explorers instead. She shares she has already tried it, but after their party suffered a crushing defeat, the others back down. For this reason, the two of them consider going inside by themselves, but then they can't muster enough courage, given they are terrified. Taka asks why they badly want to go inside. After a brief pause, Irona confesses that the Polaris leader, who died in last night's encounter was her lover. As she vows to avenge him, she reminds him of Sherry. Even though Irona is desperate to take revenge, she doesn't have Sherry's strength. Taka feels certain that once she goes into a frenzy, she will only be a burden. With everyone cowering in fear, Masala convinces Irona to just give up, and he says the same thing to Taka. The MC quickly realizes the scout's intention. He doesn't want to enter the maze with her, instead, he wants her to lose heart. Suddenly, Taka announces he has gotten cold feet and won't continue the extermination request. While Irona bursts into tears, Masala takes the opportunity to convince her to go back. Stomping on the ground, Irona walks out while shouting she will never give up. Just as they leave, Stella asks about what happened, to which Taka tells her it's nothing. And so, they get back to business and enter the maze.